Okay, you're on. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to SETI Live. Uh, my name is Simon Steele. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at the SETI Institute. And talking today with Richard Cartwright, who's a planetary astronomer at the SETI Institute as well. And we are going to be talking about Uranus, um, a long neglected planet in our solar system, and, and the moons of Uranus. And also plans, hopefully, to, to get a spacecraft back out there um, as quickly as possible. So uh, if anyone does have any questions, as usual, please do type them into uh, Facebook. Uh, let us know where you're listening from, watching from, and uh, we will have a, lots of chance uh, for you to ask your questions to Richard as we go on through the talk here. But Richard, just wanted to start. Um, sure. First of all, what got you interested in this planet? That is an excellent question. Uh, when I started in grad school and I was working on my PhD, and I was really interested in telescope observations of solar system objects. And I started doing a little bit of digging. And it turns out that since Voyager 2, there really hasn't been that much work going on in the Uranian system. And so there was just a lot of low hanging fruit. I really like icy moons. And it all just kind of gelled. And I started working on it. And I got really fascinated. And as we'll see later, their surfaces are so weird in some ways that the geology immediately wrote me in. And then when I went to figure out what their surfaces are made out of, the, the information is really sparse. So I started to really plug that gap. Okay. And uh, just so that uh, Uranus has a, you know, is quite a, a place in history because it was the first planet discovered by modern humans. Uh, right. We now live in, in, a, in a galaxy where the, the planet count is, is 4,000, almost 5,000. This was the first one. This is the first planet discovered by modern humans, which is right. pretty cool. It's really cool. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a type of planet, the ice giants, that we don't really understand. Um, we've only sent flyby missions. We haven't orbited uh, an ice giant, either uh, Uranus or Neptune. And so, you know, our information is pretty limited. And it's interesting that you mentioned the exoplanet, Ty, because that's, you know, that's an important piece of this, is that we see uh, Uranus-sized planets all over the place, but we don't understand our own, you know, Uranus-sized planets in our own backyard. And so this really goes to, you know, the case for why we need to go back to Uranus uh, with a spacecraft. And this time, instead of flying by and, you know, taking a couple measurements and, and photos along the way, go into orbit around Uranus and really try and learn what we can about the system and its moons. Yeah. Now I brought up this this picture, um, which just shows you how big this planet yeah. is. We're just not used to seeing right. uh, Uranus. Obviously, Jupiter and Saturn are bigger. Uh, it's sort of yeah. roughly the similar size to to Neptune. And this is a view from the last time it was visited, isn't it? From the Voyager two. Do you want to uh, fly us through this 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 moment in 1986? Sure. Uh, yeah, Voyager two got kind of close to uh, Uranus in terms of the uh, in terms of the moons, it discovered a bunch of ring moons as it got closer and it started to see these. And uh, for the folks at home, ring moons are just uh, small moons, tiny little moons that orbit within the ring system of Uranus as well as the other giant planets. And as it got closer, it started to discover all of these, uh, including the biggest one, Puck. Uh, the rings or the, uh, the moons are named after Shakespeare characters uh, and another writer whose name I can't remember right now. Alexander Pope, I only know Thank that because he's, he's from the same Thank town you. that I grew up in. So, yeah. Oh, interesting <laughs> trivia, right? Yes, <laughs> completely useless, but yes. <laughs> and then uh, it, you know, it, during this flyby, you know, they wanted to get close to Uranus itself in order to characterize the planet as best as they could and its magnetosphere. And so they got close to the innermost uh, large moon, which we call the classical moons, which there are five, which is Miranda. And Miranda did not disappoint. It's an absolutely uh, phenomenal moon in terms of the surface geology and the weirdness, which frankly, uh, it's, it's a pretty unique object in terms of its uh, surface compared to other icy objects in the solar system. Mm -hmm. And certainly, you know, from my perspective, of course, I'm biased, is, is worth going back and taking another look. Okay. Just to say that we've got some people watching in from Denver, from Chile, from the Netherlands, Oklahoma City. Puerto Rico, from the UK, Reno, Nevada, Germany, and Norway. So welcome, uh, everyone from around the world. Um, before we dive into the moons, I just want to put up sure. another picture. And if this isn't from Voyager. This is, this is from the uh, uh, Keck telescope 
on Hawaii, I believe. Yeah. Um, just to show a little bit more about the, the features. Now, this um, is this a, a slightly infrared image? Because we're seeing some features here of the planet that you don't normally see. It's normally completely featureless, isn't it? This big right. blue ball. I, I believe it is a little bit in the near infrared. I'm not exactly sure what filters yeah. they use for these images, but I believe so. And I think this was close to uh, Equinox. And so there starts to be some seasonal change on the planet itself. And so some things are starting to happen uh, in at least perhaps the upper atmosphere. Yeah. But don't quote me on that, but I think that's going on here. <laughs> but what I, what I love about this, this image that we were talking about earlier is you get to really see the pronounced obliquity, the, the tilt of the planet, right? I mean, it's, it's completely on its side, unlike the uh, other planets of the solar system. And so the interesting thing is that people might not realize is that all these moons that I'm interested in also orbit at this bizarre obliquity. So within the equatorial plane, the same uh, plane as the ring system. So just a, um, we've, we've got the, the solar system, which is like a, a flat disk sure. orbiting on the whole with, with a little bit of variability. Most planets orbit with their axis. They, they spin roughly in the same uh, roughly, 90 yeah. degrees to their orbit. Uh, right. The Earth is 23 and a half degrees off. That's what gives us our seasons. Jupiter's pretty much straight up 90 degrees, right. but Uranus is, is, is not, and, and it's pretty dramatic, isn't it, what's happened here? It's extremely dramatic, and this is one of the, the big mysteries you know, for the Uranian system, and one of the reasons we'd want to go back with an orbiter is to characterize, uh, and this is you know, beyond my jurisdiction for sure, but we'd want to characterize the interior of the planet and get a sense for what sort of events uh, might have knocked it on its side, whether that was a giant impact or something else. Mm -hmm. So we've got a few more people coming in. Uh, Libya, Croatia, uh, Sweden, um, Canada, uh, Vermont, Belgium, and Bronx, New York City. So welcome, everybody, uh, listening in. Um, so we're going to move away from, from the planet, uh, sure. from the ice giant itself, and we're going to dive into the, the moon system. How many moons has, has uh, Uranus got now? What's the latest count? 27 is what 27. we know of. 27, okay. yeah. 13 yeah. ring moons, five uh, classical moons, so the mid-sized moons, which we'll see in a bit, and then nine uh, what are known as irregular satellites. Mm -hmm. So they orbit at much greater distances. They tend to have uh, unusual orbits, highly uh, elliptical, or uh, elliptical, excuse me, and inclined. So they're only uh, loosely gravitationally bound to Uranus. And the other giant planets have these irregular satellites as well. So yeah. Uranus isn't unique in that regard. Mm -hmm. These ones are probably captured asteroids or things like that. Pro that's what Maybe. we think. Yeah. Right. We don't, we don't really know where they're from. Uh, we think they might be from the Kuiper Belt, so from a similar uh, region of space that Pluto is in, but perhaps beyond the orbit of Pluto. But we're really not sure. It's also possible they were captured uh, from a, a region of the solar system closer to Uranus, closer to the giant planets. Uh, and so this, this is getting into a lot of really big, uh, exciting questions in planetary science in terms of understanding where these sorts of primitive bodies uh, came from before they were captured. Yeah, yeah. And then the, there's the other the other type of uh, moon, which you said are ring moons. Now, these yeah. are sitting in amongst the rings. And of course, right. Saturn has this as well, yes. uh, has these small root, uh, ring moons. I, Saturn's rings are obvious. They're, they're, they're incredible. Um, the rings of Uranus are not so. Um, is there a big difference between or uh, theories about how they're formed or what's going on with these rings? Certainly. Uh, you know, this is, again, this is a bit out of my jurisdiction, but uh, the, I, think, I think the prevailing idea is that Uranus's rings are probably older. I, that could be a little controversial, so I should say that up front. Uh, but the idea being that perhaps Saturn's rings have been fed by material more recently, and therefore they're a little bit bigger, or much bigger, mm -hmm. I should say. Okay. Okay. It's good but, to be controversial here. Yeah. yeah. That's, 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 well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that brings us, of course, to the to the major moons, um, and I'm sure everyone's familiar yeah. with the, the major moons of, of, of uh, Jupiter, the Galilean moons. Um, yeah. Now these, we're going to look at these five moons in, yeah. in turn, and we're going to have a look at them. How do they compare, say, to the moons that people will be more familiar with? Uh, sure. Uh, you know, around, especially the Galilean moons. They're much smaller than the Galilean moons. They're more comparable in size to some of the Saturnian moons that people might be familiar with because of Cassini. Uh, so the smallest, Miranda, is pretty comparable in size to uh, Enceladus, which you know we know and love, and has you know really cool plume activity. It'd be interesting if something similar was happening at uh, Miranda as well, or maybe happened in the past. Mm -hmm. 
And so we might get into that when we look at some of the images. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ariel and Umbriel, which are the, the next two moons out actually in terms of orbital distance are also the next two in terms of size. Uh, and they're comparable to some of the mid-sized uh, Saturnian moons, maybe similar, I think, to Tethys. And then the outer moons, uh, Titania and Oberon, are the larger of the five, Titania being slightly larger than Oberon. And they're about the same size as Rhea or mm -hmm. Iapetus in okay. the uh, Saturnian system. Okay. So they're, they're mid-sized moons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, just to say uh, welcome to people from Brazil and Poland and Portland, Oregon. Arizona and, and Louisiana, and please do write in with some questions. And so we're going to have a have a look at these five fascinating moons now, and we're going to have a little tour, a look at the features. But uh, please do let us know if you have any questions um, aimed at the moons, uh, or we can try and catch Richard out on uh, the planet itself. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> but Richard, take us for a tour of, uh, of the moons. Sure. So let me. Okay. Can we see some moons? Not yet. Oh. Ah, you actually have to hear the, share, the hit the share button. Ah, there we go. Good. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So this is Miranda, which is uh, the smallest of the five. It was the one that Voyager 2 got the closest to. Uh, it's the closest to Uranus of the five. So it uh, was kind of a serendipitous sort of encounter. It was able to make a close flyby. But even in that case, it's still uh, the best images are a couple hundred uh, meters per pixel. So it's still not that great compared to modern uh, spacecraft missions to other solar system targets. But even still, just based on these images, I mean, what we're able to see is absolutely phenomenal. And so uh, are you able to see my cursor? Yes. yes. OK, so this region right here, and then in the center of the image, and then down here, these are the three coronae. That's what they, they've been labeled. And there are these large uh, regional provinces of resurfacing. Uh, tectonism is almost certainly in play, and there might be, there's some evidence for cryovolcanism also. It's something that we need to uh, investigate a little bit further. And then surrounding these three coronae, uh, which are mysterious, right? Their, their uh, geometry is quite bizarre, uh, and, and their formation mechanism, of course, is, is mysterious. But surrounding them is a more ancient surface that's uh, dominated uh, by impact features. And just to help orient people, the South Pole is about here on my cursor, right? Because the Uranian system is on its side. We saw the South Poles of these moons. Mm -hmm. So that's another big part of why we're motivated to go back to Uranus is we've never seen the Northern Hemispheres. As you get to this dark terminator around the edge, you're looking at the equator of these moons. So we don't know what's on the other side. It's not just going back to seeing something we've already seen. We really have never seen the other side. So there's a uh lot of cool stuff there. And of course, this is a flyby mission, so you don't yeah. get a chance to stop and turn around and have, have another look. It's sort of That's more, right. as you say, more like the New Horizons mission to, to Pluto. Right. You go through it, and you hope you pass by close enough. That's right, and that's that's an excellent point. And some of the measurements that you get to make with an orbiter, including with a magnetometer, is you can probe the interiors of these moons to see if they have an induced magnetic field. And the, the takeaway here is if it does, if you see that signature, then that can be suggestive of a conductive layer, which in an icy body could be a salty ocean. And so this gets back into NASA's bigger goals of looking for ocean worlds in the outer solar system, which could be, or maybe were in the past, harbors for life. And, and until we send an orbiter to Uranus, we can't really investigate these moons and figure out, are these, you know, are these the Uranian version of Enceladus? Mm -hmm. um, or were they perhaps in the uh, more recent past? And right. so Enceladus is a really good analog for Miranda, I think, in terms of the surface geology and the weirdness and probably uh, the, the youthfulness, at least in some uh, geologic provinces. Yeah. And certainly when you look at a moon, uh, the number of craters is, the, is yeah. an indication of the age of the surface. And right. we see here a lot of regions uh, that don't obviously have craters. And so right. that suggests or few. You know, yeah. activity. Yeah. 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 And again, it, it's... I can't, even though these, these images are fantastic, I can't emphasize enough that the, the resolution of what we got, the spatial resolution, was uh, too low to really do good crater counting statistics. So we don't even really have a good sense for how old their surfaces could be or how young they could be because the error bars are so large. Mm -hmm. um, but I could spend all day talking about Miranda, so we should probably- Let's, let's move on out. Keep, so we go to the next moon, which is Ariel, which honestly is probably my favorite. If I have to pick a, a favorite out of the five, this, this might be it. And 
Ariel is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, so what we're looking at here, I'm actually going to try to zoom in and hopefully this, this works. Is this working so far? It is, yes, yes. Awesome. Uh, so what you're seeing here, this sort of smudged verge, uh, area up here, this is uh, the night side. So it wasn't uh, lit by sun, but it's lit by Uranus shine. And after the mission, a long time after actually, uh, some folks did some pretty serious contrast stretching. We're able to get this little bit of detail out over the Northern hemisphere, uh, in particular for Ariel, from light being reflected off its surface from Uranus, which is pretty phenomenal. But uh, moving beyond that to actually see what Voyager saw uh, in these canyons, which are called Kasmata, we see these, you might see this sinuous looking line feature, which has some topography, it's a depression. And, uh, and then on either side is this relatively smooth, again, at the spatial resolution that we have, these smooth zones that seem to fill these, uh, these canyons. And so it's reminiscent of fissure style volcanism on Earth, perhaps. I mean, that might be the appropriate analog. This could really be evidence for, if not recent cryovolcanism, then perhaps at some point in the somewhat recent past. Mm -hmm. But we really can't investigate this sort of stuff unless we go back. And, you know, it, uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in is the composition of these moons. What are they made out of? What sorts of molecules are there? And that can tell you about their potential for uh, bio, uh, biology as well, in terms of do they have the precursors for life and that sort of thing. And one of the things that we're pretty sure is on the Uranian moons, in particular, Miranda, we just saw in an aerial, is ammonia. And ammonia is one of these great molecules. If you put it in uh, water, it will suppress its melting temperature, its freezing temperature quite substantially. And so it's possible that you can sustain subsurface activity in a subsurface ocean for a longer period of time than you might expect if it was just pure water. And so we see this salt there, we see ammonia there. And so we think it's possible that these moons, at least some of them could have had oceans for a lot longer than you might suspect uh, otherwise. And so perhaps this ammonia was helping uh, to drive cryovolcanism that gets expressed on the surface. And yeah. an aerial might be one of the better examples of that, at least in the Uranian system. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, there's a whole, there's a slew of tectonic features that are really weird all over the <laughs> surface. And again, we could spend forever on this one. This is, this is certainly one of my favorites, yeah. my favorite. So a question from Christopher, um, oh, sure. who asks, uh, is it likely that any moon interiors aren't fully solid? And I think you partially uh, uh, described the, that from the surface features. But yeah. an, until you go back and study right. these moons in more detail, you can't be sure. Right. I, I suspect that in the past, almost for sure, they had subsurface oceans for some uh, geologically relevant period of time. Let's, let's, let's say that whether they still do or whether they go through periods where maybe they have subsurface oceans, I think is a very exciting question. In particular for the last moon that we saw, Miranda, the small one, uh, because of uh, it being the smallest moon, the orbital resonances that look, uh, they don't currently have any orbital resonances that they share, but it looks like they did in the past. And as a consequence, because Miranda has the lowest mass, it works out the net results is that a lot of tidal energy might get dumped into Miranda which would help heat up its interior and then spur melting and drive cryovolcanism. So Miranda could look the way that it did because of recent melting. I mean, it's, okay. it's actually supported possibly by uh, the modeling work that's been done recently by other okay. people at SETI, actually. OK. OK. Yeah. Um, let's take a trip. Next one out is Umbriel, yeah. I believe. Right. So I've got these. Let me zoom out here. I've got all three of these guys on the same slide here. Mm -hmm. So this is the next moon. This is Umbriel. And it's the darkest of the five. Uh, and it's the middle. It's, it's kind of the middle child, if you will. It gets kind of, <laughs> it gets overlooked, right? Because its surface looks to be uh, dark and old. And I think it's deceiving. I think there's actually a lot more going on on, on Umbriel than it gets credit for. Mm -hmm. There is uh, evidence for uh, global scale tectonic uh, deformation. If you do high contrast stretching shenanigans, again, you can pull these polygonal basins out uh, mm -hmm. that are hidden be beneath this dark veneer that's probably accumulated over the age of the solar system. Uh, Umbriel has some really bright craters. You can see at the top of the image here, again, remember the South Pole is in the, is in the center of these images. So this is uh, close to its equator on its trailing side on the back side of this, of this object. It's got this bright annulus of material that's filling the floor of what's called Wunda Crater. 
what this material is made out of. Did it form from cryovolcanism? Is it a coal trap for CO2 ice, which is very abundant in the Iranian system? There's a lot of CO2 ice on all five moons, especially Ariel. Oh, sorry. Uh, we haven't found it on Miranda. I should correct myself. On the, the four larger moons, we haven't seen it on Miranda yet. Uh, but whether this annulus could be CO2 ice, is, it's definitely an open question. And then uh, moving out to, and also, unfortunately, you know, the, the spatial resolution of these images decreases as we go further out. Because again, Voyager 2 just did this quick flyby and the moons, wherever they were in their orbits, they- They, they were just captured. further away from the spacecraft. Yeah, as it yeah, went through. Yeah. Got, yeah. got what we got. <laughs> and so we get to Titania and now the, the resolution, this is the largest moon, but the resolution is quite poor at this point, several mm -hmm. uh, kilometers per pixel. And you can still see that there is this global scale or at least regional scale uh, tectonic deformation across its equator perhaps not unlike what we see on Charon across its uh, uh, equatorial region. There's a large band of uh, tectonic deformation. And then there's some, uh, it's hard to see in this image, but there are some spectrally red regions, which could be uh, organic material, which is exposed on the surface. And then when we go to the uh, outermost moon, uh, Oberon, there does seem to be, even in this image, you can kind of see these red darkest patches, which we think might be organic rich and could actually, and so this is something that we'd want to look at with a mission, uh, could actually be dust that's accumulated from the irregular satellites. So even though the irregular satellites orbit from a long, long distance, a long, you know, a long way away from Uranus, they might contribute material that over millions of years slowly migrates toward Uranus. But before making it to the planet, it gets swept up by the uh, outer moons. And so maybe this can explain some of the dark a darkish patches on the surfaces, not unlike their relationship between Iapetus and Phoebe, although that's a more dramatic example of that sort of relationship. How close are these? Um, these are colored images. This is a roughly uh, the color of the moons. It's roughly the color of the surfaces. Yeah. Okay. So they're pretty gray. Yeah. Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, all of all five of them are, and that that goes to their composition. They have. Uh, their densities, their bulk densities suggest, sure, there's a lot of water ice, but there's a lot of other stuff too, probably a good bit of silicate material. Uh, and then other ices along with water ice, like CO2, which we know is there and uh, could be endogenic, could be formed from uh, magnetic field interactions or maybe both. And then mm -hmm. there's other uh, constituents as well, which contribute to its bulk density okay. and its grayish color. Now, the, there was that lovely image from, from Keck, um, and there's a question here uh, about whether you'd be able to use uh, the James Webb Space Telescope to look at um, oh, yeah. the moons. Um, yeah. Are there any sort of plans in the works for that? Well, there, there just could be. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's certainly something that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of a team, and we are hoping to get some time on JWST. Mm -hmm. So for, for folks who, who don't know, JWST has uh, guaranteed time observations for certain objects in the solar system, and the Uranian moons are not on that list. Mm -hmm. So we will put in a proposal and try and get some time in order to see what we can see in terms of what are they made out of. Uh, made out of. We won't mm -hmm. get good images in terms of uh, spatial resolution, so we won't be able to look at the geology. But their composition is something we can really nail down with JWST in a way that we just can't do with any other facility that uh, we currently have available. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying to me is you need a spacecraft. Um, right. And you need one that's actually going to get there and stay there, more akin right. to Cassini or Galileo. Tell us, tell me a little bit, tell us a little sure. bit about what, you're, what you would like um, sure. out of this mission. Yeah, so uh, in terms of... What I would like is uh, uh, an orbiter at Uranus. So it would actually go into orbit around Uranus and then make uh, multiple close flybys of the planets, or excuse, excuse me, of the moons, of each moon, uh, characterize the surface in terms of composition, obviously geology, use the magnetometer to look at the uh, interior to look for induced magnetic fields, as I was describing earlier, and then also characterize the system as a whole, uh, measure the dust, uh, measure uh, material in the uh, outer rings of Uranus. So it would be a, a case of looking at the, the ring moons as well as the five uh, larger moons we looked at. And then of course, if the mission is uh, successful and goes for long enough, 
we can probably start to prioritize observations of the irregular satellites. So turn all the instruments outwards and start looking at these distant, probably captured asteroid type objects and start to uh, characterize them as well, which is something we have experience with doing with uh, Cassini, uh, which did the same thing when it turned it instruments outwards and, and looked at Saturn's uh, irregular moons. Yeah. Now Cassini also was carrying a lander, although if you had a choice, would you would you try and get a lander? Is that that's that useful in this in this particular instance? That's an interesting question. You mean the uh, Huygens probe? That yeah, the Huygens on, probe. Obviously, that has Titan. a very yeah. very different different moon. Uh, yeah, um, I think so. I think I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I say, mm -hmm. and I say that, and I'm I'm juggling different priorities in my head here as I say that. I think from my perspective, the remote sensing is what's key. Mm -hmm. uh, for the mid-sized moons. Now, if you want to put a probe on the spacecraft to launch it into Uranus's atmosphere, that's a different, mm -hmm. different ballgame. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who are strong advocates for that because even if you're in orbit around Uranus and you're constantly taking measurements, you're still you're blocked in terms of how deep you can get in the atmosphere unless you put a probe in there. So I think that's what they would want to do is launch a probe uh, into the actual atmosphere for the planet itself. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. for the moons... Uh, you know, there's there's plenty of instruments I would love to have, but in terms of minimum payload, uh, visible light camera, obviously get great images, uh, a near infrared mapping spectrometer. So just looking at the surface composition and comparing it to the geology and then the magnetometer, which I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Lots of other instruments I would love, but those are the three that I think are like the uh, minimum requirements for this one. Right. Uh, question from Holly: If you were standing on one of these moons, uh, let's pick Miranda. What would sure. it look like? What are you seeing? Um, could you see oh, the man. rings? Um, yeah, I think you could. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you were in, you know, your space cabin or whatever, if you were, you know, sequestered and safe, and you were looking outwards, yeah, I think you would see the rings. Uh, you would certainly, at different parts of the orbit, you would see the other mid-sized moons. Um, you would see the sun, very distant. Uh, and, you know, if you had some telescopes with you, you could probably spy on Earth from the surface of Miranda. <laughs> Are there any, um, uh, places like Jupiter and Saturn have very large magnetic fields. Is, yeah. is, is, uh, what's the radiation risk here for, for, mm. for, for, for a mission to Uranus? Are we talking same scale or? No, much less. Yeah. Uh, we, well, again, we think, based mm -hmm. on the data that we have from Voyager 2, uh, you know, so characterizing the uh, Uranus's magnetosphere is a big part of the motivation to go back to Uranus. This, you know, the, the magnetosphere of any planet is a dynamic zone. It's constantly changing. It's constantly having material added to it and removed from it. So if you do a flyby, you just get a snapshot. It's kind of like taking a, a satellite image of a river and never taking another image of it and then you know, you don't really understand how that river would work in terms of if it gets larger at different times of the year, et cetera. And the Uranian magnetosphere could be a pretty dynamic place. And it could change over seasonal timescales because, again, the obliquity of Uranus uh, probably introduces a lot of weirdness to the magnetosphere, which mm -hmm. also for, for folks at home, in case they don't know, the magnetosphere is offset from the rotational axis of the planet. So there's an additional offset there Right, so you've got the huge offset for the the rotation of the whole system, and then the magnetosphere itself is is offset from that. So there's all sorts of weird interactions, probably between the moons and the magnetosphere that we don't that we can't really characterize unless we're in orbit for a long period of time and we can kind of build up a nice, uh, juicy data set. Yeah. In fact, one of the questions uh, is: there anything abnormal that's happening in this system because it's inclined at this yeah. this angle? Big and that time. sounds like uh, lots of stuff is being messed up, which is nice because you can compare that to, to other planets. Yeah. And, and this goes back to also we were talking about uh, a spacecraft mission. In terms of the timing, I didn't quite get to that. Uh, mm -hmm. If we were able to get the spacecraft off the ground in terms of planning and uh, initializing it in the next decade, and if we're able to launch during 2030 to 2034, where's where we can get this uh, Jupiter assist boost. Uh, to the to the the speed of the spacecraft as it's heading out toward the outer solar system, which is really key. If you want to send a spacecraft beyond Saturn, for, uh, well, really beyond Jupiter, you need to get some sort of gravitational boost or utilize some other technology in order to get there in a timely fashion. 
-hmm. And so if we're able to hit that launch window, make a close pass of Jupiter, take a bunch of images, of course, mm -hmm. and then get that boost from its, its, uh, from its, uh, the gravity assist, then we fly out to Uranus. We can get there in only about 11 years, which gives us uh, a fair amount of time uh, based on the, what we know about RTGs and how long they last uh, in terms of the, uh, the energy system right, mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, spacecraft and then go into orbit and take a bunch of images. And if we did this, it all kind of works out so that we get to Uranus in the early to mid 2040s, mm -hmm. long time from now, fair. <laughs> but once we get yes. there, uh, Uranus goes through equinox in 2049. So we can get there, take a bunch of images and then watch seasonal change happening. Mm -hmm. So we get the Northern hemispheres, which we've never seen before of the moons, wait around and we can see what sort of seasonal changes happen in, in the Uranian system after that. And it's not just the planet itself. The moons themselves probably experience some sort of seasonal change as well, because their surfaces have, like I said, CO2 ice on it, which is probably volatile uh, when exposed to sunlight for long periods of time, like it would be during the summer. So we can see all this, this seasonal change affect the moon surfaces uh, along with the planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. So not yeah. too bad. 2041, did you say? Oh, <laughs> they can't wait. Um, What's the next, I suppose, the next step as far as getting, you know, uh, one of, one of uh, somebody wrote in and say, should we, should we be writing letters to NASA to request yeah. this? Uh, the, the process is, is quite, quite long and labored, isn't it, it to is. do this? And yeah. so, and money has to be spread. You know, there right. are people who, you know, prefer Neptune. There are people who right. want to go to Venus. You know, right. there's a, lots of stuff that is really cool to do. Um, right. What is the process roughly about get, getting a mission? Right. So roughly, uh, the next step for this is the uh, Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey, uh, which carries out a, a long study, and they uh, accept uh, a bunch of white papers. And this is where this project went in, is a white paper to that body. And they will break up into subpanels and read these white papers and put together their recommendations to NASA for these are the missions that you should be thinking about for the next decade. The last Decadal Survey which was released in 2013, had a Uranus orbiter as the third highest rated priority with a mission uh, with Mars 2020 being number one and some version of a Europa mission being number two. And the Mars 2020 and the Europa mission, of course, have, they're happening. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, hopefully Uranus or ice giants in general kind of float closer to the top of that list and they become a, a higher priority uh, for NASA. So they'll take those recommendations from the, the decadal survey and they take, NASA certainly takes them seriously. And then they will uh, fold that into their thinking in terms of what do they want to do for the next 10 years in terms of uh, mission planning and is a flagship mission to Uranus in the cards or not. So we'll mm -hmm. find out, I don't know, maybe a couple years from now, <laughs> it's going to be a while. <laughs> yeah. But hey, third, as you say, uh, Perseverance is on its way, Europa yeah. Clipper, which was number two and yeah. you know, sitting there in third place fingers yeah. crossed yeah yeah just to wrap up what what would you like to find i know you know we do lots of things we'd like to find what what would what would be a um a success well, for you beyond actually you know the mission itself well right because the mission itself would certainly be a success just yes. to go there get images of the northern hemispheres compare them to the southern hemispheres to see you know it, are they the same how different are they but i think Thinking about it uh, more broadly, it would be a success if we detected evidence for subsurface oceans on any of these five moons. I think that would tell us something very important about our solar system and about uh, planetary systems in general, in terms of the potential for ocean worlds uh, and possible habitats for life beyond Earth. And so if we need to be able to characterize the whole catalog of different sorts of ocean worlds. And we know of a few, right? We know of Europa, of course, and Ganymede and Callista, which are ocean worlds, and also Enceladus. But finding out if these, uh, this body, these class of bodies as ocean worlds are also in the Uranian system, I think would be really important. So that's yeah. probably number one. Good. Okay. Yeah. And on that note, uh, rejoin us in a couple of years' time for when this mission is going <laughs> to start. <laughs> and, and in 2041, we'll, we'll be back, maybe a little grayer but you know, who knows <laughs> we'll um, still be here we'll still be here <laughs> um thank you everybody for watching uh participating and the questions and telling us where you're from thank you richard uh for this very Great. exciting uh it's such an amazing planet we need to get back soon yeah um and that's thanks for having me 
and um, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>